My goodness, I had hoped for a bit of a quiet life after retirement, but it still really does seem that lessons from the past aren't being remembered, just as Trevor always used to say. I've come to the future, for me an intensely unfamiliar place, to try and make sure that a potentially deadly accident doesn't happen. I'm looking for my counterpart, the ghost of chemical engineering yet to come, but I can't seem to find him. Oh my goodness, there he is, I think. Hello, old chap. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Ah, uh, I have been expecting you. You have? Yes, I've been working on a lot of new designs lately, and I was thinking that some of them could benefit from a little wisdom from the past. I'm sure that in some cases we're trying to redo some things that have already been done, but that the details have been long since forgotten or never learnt by some of the engineering team working on them. Oh, well, I'd be glad to help if I can, but could you do me a favour? Let me guess, the future is a little uncomfortable for you and you'd like to go back to somewhere from your era? If it's no trouble, I would prefer that, thank you. No problem, see, it's already done. Oh, wonderful, thank you very much. Look, I'm sorry to appear and take up your time, but I couldn't help but get wind of what you were saying around carbon dioxide emissions and the alarming spectre of climate change. In some way, I feel responsible for part of this. If we'd realised what chaos we were causing with the industry we were building when I was a practising engineer, we would have started to do something about these problems much, much earlier. I'm so awfully sorry. It's not really your fault. After all, when even climate science was proved beyond all reasonable doubt at the turn of the millennium, there were still a lot of dissenters, including world leaders, who dismissed a lot of the painstaking, peer-reviewed, verifiable research as nothing more than a hoax. Sadly, vested interest in short-term gains ruled the day, even though increasingly large numbers of people started to realise the seriousness of it all and wanted to see drastic action implemented quickly. It strikes me that people haven't fundamentally changed from my day then. What was it I heard you say once? Don't try and change people, but change their environment. Yes, I suppose so. Look, before we stray too far off topic, I wanted to check with you one or two safety-related matters specifically the safe handling of inert gases, of which carbon dioxide is notably one. OK, go on. Just remind me of a few points that might have been lost to history. Well, all right then. I'd like to do this by telling you two stories. I'm sure you've heard them before, and do stop me if I'm boring you. I don't mind being told again. Even if I have heard them before, I can satisfy myself that I'm remembering them correctly. Good chap. Thank you for humouring me. So, the stories I want to tell really concern folk who have perished whilst being exposed to inert gas environments, mostly nitrogen, due to a lack of understanding about the severity of the hazard posed. I assume that you're talking about nitrogen blanketing? Yes, that's right. Typically used in any vessel that handles flammable liquids to prevent a vapour explosion from occurring. If nitrogen is used to displace the oxygen containing air in the vapour space above a flammable liquid, then even if a source of ignition presents itself or an auto-ignition temperature is exceeded, then there won't be any problems. It's a key piece of engineered safety to prevent fires and explosions. Quite right. Nitrogen blanketing is more or less ubiquitous on plants that handle flammables, right? Right, and usually during continuous operation it doesn't pose a hazard. However, it can pose a severe hazard during shutdowns and maintenance periods when people physically inspect the internals of vessels. Let me guess, there's sometimes complacency, or at least a lack of understanding, of the severity of the hazard because people are breathing 79% nitrogen all the time. Quite so. Sometimes folk tend not to fully appreciate that the remaining 21% of oxygen is rather vital and that even small decreases in that level can start to pose a severe threat to life. I remember one horrendous incident that I was responsible for investigating that involved a petroleum storage tank on a refinery. The tank had been taken out of service for quite some time due to some corrosion products being noticed in the gasoline fraction that was stored in it. So. When the next refinery maintenance period came along, it was put on the list of vessels to be inspected. There was a strict permit to work procedure in place at the time, a part of which physically prevented people from accessing vessels until they had completed all relevant training. But despite that, an experienced person made a fatal error. How did that happen? It was what we termed mismatch. In this case, the person concerned had a lot of things going on in his personal life that meant that his focus on the job wasn't as good as it should have been. Add to that, the inspection team was short-handed due to illness and there was a significant amount of management pressure to complete the inspections 
such that the refinery could be brought back online again. A perfect storm really, really was brewing. This doesn't sound good. No, it wasn't. Cutting a long story short, the inspector concerned was pushing through an unreasonably long inspection schedule and having to work late into the evening at the end of what had already been a busy week. He was under such pressure and working at such high levels of stress and fatigue, he made a fatal assumption that since the tank had been standing out of service for some time, it had already been vented of all its flammables and all inert gas. He made an assumption of safety when there was no evidence to prove it and in his fatigued and stressed state he put his head through the inspection hatch into the tank to check access requirements before he put his breathing apparatus on. So he didn't go in the tank? No, he didn't have to for it to be a fatal accident. The atmosphere in the tank was completely inert, 0% oxygen, 100% nitrogen and of course it only took two breaths for him to be rendered fully unconscious. That's horrible. People always forget or deny to themselves just how fast asphyxiation can occur in inert gas atmospheres. Yes, they do. They forget about the basis of mass transfer along concentrated gradients and the fact that as soon as you have a lung full of inert gas, all the oxygen diffuses out of your bloodstream. Three seconds later, that deoxygenated blood gets to your brain and you black out. Wasn't his buddy able to drag him out and revive him? No, his buddy had gone for a toilet break, working on the assumption that his partner wouldn't try to gain access to the tank interior until he was there, which, strictly speaking, was true. His partner had simply assumed that the internal atmosphere wouldn't be 100% inert and that he could quickly stick his head in, assess the access arrangements and then gain entry properly when his buddy was back. His buddy must have been absolutely beside himself. Yes, he was. He tried to revive his partner with CPR until the emergency services attended. Unfortunately, neither the emergency services nor the hospital accident and emergency unit could revive him. He left behind a lovely wife, a young daughter. It was an absolutely terrible state of affairs. It makes it far worse when you actually know the people involved, as we all did. That is a chilling reminder about the perils of gaff safety for sure. What was the second story you wanted to tell? Well, it's along similar lines, but it serves to remind one that the, of the definition of a confined space. Remind me what that definition is again? Certainly, the formal definition of a confined space is one which is either enclosed or largely enclosed, and which also has reasonably foreseeable risk to work as a fire, explosion, loss of consciousness, asphyxiation or drowning. The story I'm going to tell st remind, is a stark reminder about those words largely enclosed. Let me guess, problems with wells, pits and sumps? Exactly. Just because a space is open to the air doesn't prevent it being an asphyxiation hazard. The situation that occurred one day, which I'll never forget sadly, concerned an effluent collection sump on a site I used to work on. This sump was essentially a hole in the ground about 20 feet deep by 20 feet in diameter, lined with concrete and with a ladder down one side to allow some valves on the pipework that drained it to be accessed. The top of the hole was covered with a large steel grating to prevent people from falling in it, but otherwise it was open to atmosphere. That sounds like an accident waiting to happen. Why was there a need to access it in the first place? Couldn't the valves and pipework have been placed somewhere slightly less lethal? Quite so, a point I tried to hammer home as soon as I was made aware of this sump's existence. But the management at the time was slow to listen and I had actually gone ahead anyway to try and push through some emergency changes. Sadly, the accident happened only a few days after I'd started to try and improve the situation. A maintenance technician saw that some of the valves had been incorrectly set and went into the sump to try and correct them. Because the sump was open to atmosphere and it was a quick and easy job, he thought he could get away without taking the normal precautions. It turned out that it held on to a master key for all the confined space access locks and so was able to enter a locked off environment without having to go through the normal routes. What on earth? Wait, don't judge the chap. You'll see there was a logic to why he'd done that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It's okay. Anyway, the maintenance technician unlocked the gate over the sump and climbed down remedied the valve setting and was knocked unconscious by the dense gas that had accumulated in the base of the sump. The investigation showed that a mixture of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulphide had accumulated unexpectedly and displaced the air. Poor chap fell off the ladder into the liquid effluent and subsequently drowned. That's dreadful. And the assumption of safety was because the sump was open to atmosphere? Quite so, except that dense gases would accumulate in these below ground level areas, sometimes in lethal concentrations. 
Initially, the poor chap was blamed for his own death, having broken all the procedures for safe inspections. At the inquest, the company concerned was pushing for a verdict of death by misadventure, in the hope of preventing any legal action from the technician's family. What emerged upon deeper investigation, however, was that a number of near misses concerning the sump had been reported to the health and safety executive in the years preceding the accident, and an improvement notice was in force at the time of the accident. Moreover, the fact the technician had his own master key was due to his line manager obstructing his work in the hope that he might resign. There had been friction between those two people for a number of years. The line manager concerned was eventually dismissed for bullying, harassment and trying to obtain constructive dismissal of a long-standing employee with an impeccable employment record. It transpired that the technician was just trying to do his job to the best of his ability in very difficult circumstances and sadly made a fatal error. Incidentally, the inquest returned a verdict of accidental death and the company was successfully sued by the technician's relatives for an undisclosed but large sum of money. Sheesh. So the messages never to forget are that inert gas environments can be deadly in a very short space of time and that even if a confined space is open to air, don't assume it's safe in any way. Correct. So back to your carbon dioxide handling systems. Not only are you dealing with an asphyxiant, but a dense gas and a toxic gas. What precautions are you putting in place? Well, in any of the confined spaces that are likely to trap carbon dioxide, we've placed oxygen monitors and low oxygen level alarms. The low oxygen level alarm is set to a first stage warning alarm at 19% oxygen and then a second stage full alarm at 17% oxygen. So that should keep anyone working in the environment safe. No, it won't. Sorry? Why not? You've overlooked a fact that tends to get missed a lot by people who don't routinely deal with carbon dioxide safety. The levels that you've set your oxygen alarms to are perfectly reasonable, but the problem is that the 8-hour workplace exposure limit for carbon dioxide is only 0.5%. By the time that the first stage warning sounds on your low oxygen level alarm, there could be up to 2% carbon dioxide present, and by the time your second stage full alarm sounds, there could be up to 4% carbon dioxide present. Both those levels can be deadly, and please reassure me that both oxygen and carbon dioxide is in monitoring in place in the pipe trenches. Depending on their depth, they can also be classified as confined spaces. I'm so glad we've had this conversation. People say, learn from the past, but it's not often that I get to do it firsthand. I'm guilty of not being aware of the full facts on carbon dioxide toxicity, and I hadn't realised that there was a glaring hole in the safety cover that we were implementing. No, we hadn't considered pipe trenches as confined spaces. But now that you've mentioned it, I will check the relevant legislation. They are deep, roughly 10 feet, where they run along the side of roadways, so I suspect that they will have to be reclassified as confined spaces. I suspect you're right. I'm glad we've had this conversation as well. If I can help prevent any more accidents, then my work is done. Right, well I must go now as I have to redo all the carbon dioxide safety audits on the new plant that's being designed. Thank you so much again for your advice. Well, he's faded back to the future. It is nice working with folk of different generations. It's always good to see things from their perspective and I hope that they feel the same in getting a perspective they might not otherwise have had. You know, since I'm back in my favourite steelworks again, I might just stay here a while. Belgian beer and hospitality is second to none and I am somewhat keen on their fine selection of spirits. I hope this was informative for you, and I wish you well in your future. Maybe one day we'll bump into each other again.